welcome. You're listening to Latin Waves with your host, Sylvia and Stuart Richardson. Latin Waves is more than just hot rhythms. This is a show about community, about creating a culture that is inclusive and based on fairness. Because everyone deserves dignity, respect, and has something to contribute. A new world is possible, and it all starts with us. You're listening to Latin Ways, and your host, Sylvia Richardson. I am delighted to be joined by one of my heroes, Dr. Robin Hanel. He is the author of many, many, many books that I've enjoyed and that have informed my ideas about economics. His latest is Democratic Economic Planning. We're delighted to have you on our program, Robin. Thank you for joining us. It's great to be with you, Sylvia. You know, one of the things that I, I've learned is that Hegemony has been this idea of imperial power, right? Imp imposing a way of seeing, a way of being in the world. Neoliberalism has been imposed by us through U.S. policies and politics. And it has also been imposed through the point of guns. You know, most of us in Latin America have seen bloody revolutions fought to protect the safety nets we had right you know be it education communications you know trying to keep our own currency and and many have failed to win that battle you know in the case of small countries like El Salvador no longer has its own currency you know most of the essential things have been privatized and so it is a very dire world that we wake up to every day And yet, you know, as Eduardo Galeano said, apathy is not a luxury we can afford. So staying positive, this means for me, we're going to have to create that system with or without our government's, you know, guidance, leadership, because we haven't, we have seen none. You know, right now we see Biden upholding the sanctions that were increased against Cuba by Trump. So where's the difference, right? We see massive evictions being, ex you know, effective of people who have not been able to work for a year because they were told to stay home and they abided. They listened to the instruction and stay home so they could protect others from contagion. So in many ways, the leadership has to come from the ground up. It, you know, it, it, it doesn't seem like it's going to come from people who are very comfortable in very big homes and with all the luxuries that they can afford and enjoy. The Biden administration has been very disappointing in terms of its Latin American policy. And it's very, very simple. The Biden administration, Latin American policy is a huge disappointment already. The Trump administration, Latin American policy was far worse. And eight years of Obama and the Obama administration policy and the Clinton administration policy before that. So With respect to Latin America, Democratic White Houses and Republican White Houses, their policy has been terrible. Now, that means there's a huge responsibility for citizens in the United States to do everything we possibly can to change those policies. Change the Biden policy toward Venezuela. Change the policy toward the, the new Biden policy toward, uh, toward Cuba. Prevent you know, the Biden administration from intervening, you know, on the side of Fujimori and those in, you know, that are going to try and, and, and upset the, 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 the new government in Peru and the new government in Bolivia. So that's our responsibility. That's the responsibility of anti-imperialists who understand the United States, that Democrats and Republicans in the White House have continued the two-century-old process, you know, policy of intervening in the internal affairs of Latin American countries to the detriment of their citizens. On the other hand, intellectually, one of the things I do is when governments like the Cuban government and the Nicaraguan government and the Salvadoran government, when progressive governments battle through all that and have the chance to try and implement new economic systems and policies, then What do they learn from experience in terms of what works and what doesn't work and what has to be done and what shouldn't be done? The socialists and the revolutionaries in Latin America, that's what they have to do. They have to fight against U.S. imperialism, of course. And, and we in the United States 
have to try and prevent that imperialism from being imposed on them. But they're the ones that have to figure out how, when we do win a chance, whether it's in Venezuela or in Cuba or El Salvador or Nicaragua or Ecuador or Peru now or Bolivia or again in Venezuela in, 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 in Argentina where there's a new opening, how do they do things there differently than the way socialists have done things every place in the world in the past to, to bring better outcomes? That's where I've tried to make an intellectual contribution. I can't make a political contribution as an activist in Latin America. But I can try and make an intellectual contribution in terms of what all socialists worldwide, what kind of lessons do we have to learn and what kind of things do we have to have better answers for than we've had than, than we have actually had in the past. I also think that for us living in the belly of empire, you know, the political contribution we make is by creating examples within our communities, right, of people power, you know, when we side with indigenous people who are asserting their rights, we're making a political contribution, you know, it's always political, you know, whether we get vaccines or whether we deny access to health care, whether we get education or whether we just get trained to be tools in a machine line, you know, that that's always political. The diversity of uh, opportunities we're offered is always directly connected to our level of engagement. And some people are completely denied even access at the door. You know, indigenous people here in Canada have been denied even the right to defend themselves when they're being completely aggressed by the government against acts of genocide that took place in this country. They couldn't even take them to court because they were prohibited from fundraising to get the legal defense to go. So, you know, there is there is a history, you know, that we all share and is drenched in blood. And, you know, that can only change when we are willing to look at it and say, OK, this is what we have. How do we change it? So one of the things you point out is that climate change has, unlike all other social movements, we always think, oh, we didn't get it done this time. We'll try again. There'll be another way. That's right. Try, try. <laughs> try, try again is what we've always had to do as, as, as humans, yeah. you know, in terms of trying to improve our social institutions. I do think it, the, the analogy of we can give ourselves incomplete yeah. um, is, is the appropriate analogy. And what we must realize is nature isn't going to give humanity an incomplete. <laughs> no. You're going to have to get it right. And you're not going to get to come back and take the course over again next term. No, I mean, um, we've had 350 fires in British Columbia, a town near us just completely vanish, you know, and and that those fires. So it's increasingly apparent. It's, it's increasingly apparent the Western wildfires and the I mean, the, the heat dome that we had and we had it. I mean, you had it in British Columbia. We had it up here in the northwest. Um, and that heat dome is completely and totally unprecedented. All the signals are there. That part, people are waking up to. Now, there's a segment of the population that's in total denial about it. I mean, they watch Fox News and they listen to Trump and they listen to the fossil fuel companies and they just are complete victims of. But for a majority of the population in Canada, the United States, the signals are very, 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 very clear. And I am not hopeless that even prior to overthrowing our terrible economic system, we can avoid the disaster. And that's one thing I wanted to say, by the way, that one of the things that I'm very proud about in the new book is that looking forward, if we want to design a desirable economy for the 21st century, one of the things that has to be different about that economy is it certainly has to be a lot better about dealing with environmental issues and climate change then designing a desirable economy in 1800 would have been. There we didn't have the crisis upon us. So there's a lot more specific material on how do you manage in a planning process, in an annual planning process, how do you manage to make sure that people are going to be taking into account the environmental costs of everything that they're doing, not just how difficult was it to produce the good for somebody working at the machine. And I'm very, very happy that we have some very, very concrete, specific proposals about how you do long-term environmental planning and 
how you can identify when you made mistakes in those plans. Because when, you when you're doing long-term planning, you have to make assumptions about certain things. You want to design the procedures so that you have the best process for making the best guess you can. But you more importantly want to design procedures so you will be able to identify mistakes you made, which you will inevitably make, and figure out how you can make adjustments. And that's the kind of thing we have to do when we do in long-term environmental planning. And there's an awful lot of specific proposals in the new book that never were in anything else we were able to put out there before. By the middle of this century, or the end of this century, we're going to need an economic system that handles the environment sensibly. So that's an intellectual project at this point. The problem is, to get to the point where we can even do that, we're going to have to prevent climate change. And that means we're going to have to prevent climate change in a largely capitalist world. Yeah. And I think it can still be done, but that's the emergency fight. That's the wildfires that are coming for your community, and you better figure out something to do about it. Yeah. Well, one of the things that I I love about the idea of a democratic economic planning is that I always think, you know, uh, as a, on a personal level, I tend to overestimate what I can do in one day, but I tend to underestimate what I can do in a year. And when I look at my year, I'm like, wow, I did that. I did that. I did that. I did that. But I, I am always feeling like, oh, I, I'm constantly giving myself an incomplete because I overbook myself for the day thinking I can do all of these things, right? And so I think sometimes we can drive ourselves into overwhelm, but I love your idea of having a short-term plan and a long-term plan, you know, having things that allow us to look at our short-term plan, you know, reevaluate where we went well, what, what worked, right? Work with what's working and then, you know, adjust our long-term plan as, as needed. And one of the things that I need to ask you is, in a democratic planning system, we must include, you know, social determinants of health, you know, whether it be eradicating poverty through a universal basic income where everybody has a basic to meet their basic needs, where we have a health care that meets everyone's needs regardless of their ability to pay, and where everybody has a home, a place to 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 sleep, you know, because then when you're not vulnerable to the elements and everything, you're more likely to be creative and conductive to be productive in some way to your society and to yourself, right? We make very clear in the new book that that a public health care system where basic health care is provided free of charge is simply an absolute, you know, it's an absolute requirement for a desirable society and desirable economy. And there's no reason it can't be done. And so, I mean, we do talk in specifics about that. The thing that I would say in the new book, the, the, the problem we tackled in the new book, and, when it, and, and I'm going to be very, very honest with people about this. When you've made a proposal and then it's been debated, discussed, and argued about over a period of time, like decades and decades, well, then you can feel more confident about have we got this right? How firm am I in my opinion that this is the best way to handle something? Um, but when you are sort of making proposals for the first time, I think that it's important to be a little more self-doubting about it. It's important to say, look, nobody had made concrete proposals in this regard, and we're making them, but now we need to listen. We knew that you have to do long-term planning of different kinds, as well as coordinate workers' councils and consumer councils in the here and now and in the annual planning process. And we had talked sort of vaguely about how you're going to have to do the long-term planning, but we had never made any concrete proposals about how do you do that long-term planning and how do you integrate the long-term planning with the annual planning so that you will identify and correct mistakes that were made in the long-term plan. And that's one of the things I think I'm most proud about in the new book. We finally, in this version, um, have managed to tackle an issue that we were really vague about. But when you do that, then you need to be a little more humble about your defense of it. I'm waiting to hear where we did not get some things right in this new regard. But that's just an important debate that has to happen. I mean, the same thing really has taken place in terms of, of reproductive labor. Mm. Feminist, so, feminist economists and socialist feminists have done a brilliant job of telling us everything that's wrong. 
with how it is that we currently are handling under neoliberal capitalism, reproductive labor, how it's unfair, how it generates gender discrimination of all sorts of kinds. But that's not the same as saying, well, do you have concrete proposals for how to do things differently? Do you have concrete proposals how to prevent this from happening, even if sort of well-minded people manage to establish a new economy? How are you going to keep these same things from happening over again? And so, again, that's an area where for the first time we went into print and said, well, we're going to make some very, very concrete suggestions. And these things need to be debated. They need to be discussed. But that's the point. They do need to be discussed. And you can't discuss something unless there's a concrete proposal out there on the table for how do you want to handle this. You listen to Latin Ways. To support our work, please visit latinwaysmedia.com and consider becoming a member for as little as $1 per month. Thank you for listening. One of the proposals by Silvia Federici is that we deserve to have wages for our reproductive and productive labor that, you know, it's often just say, oh, it's the feminine thing for women to do all the cooking, for women to do all the cleaning, for women to, in addition to go to work and do all those things because it's a labor of love. Well, we, we've been saying that that's actually work and it should be paid. And we make some very specific proposals in the new book about how is it that reproductive labor done in households should be rewarded? I'm going to mention one tricky thing. Don't we want people to make different decisions about how they do that? So we have some people who say, well, I want to be a stay-at-home mom or I want to be a stay-at-home dad. And we have other people who say, no, um, I really want to go to work and we would like to have um, child care, you know, that's affordable, that's part of what, you know, every person can choose. So how do you set up a system where you give people the choice in terms of how they, how they handle that situation? What am I going to do? What, what's a couple going to do, you know, with their own, with their children in the first five to six years of that children's life before they go off to kindergarten or whatever? How is all that going to be done? And we want to give people options. We want to give them options, but we want to be sure that everybody is actually being treated fairly under every option that they might choose. And that requires making some specific proposals and sort of arguing the pros and cons of, 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 of different options. And we just would like to encourage more people to engage in that kind of discussion. I think it's brilliant that you have not only brought us with your book, Participatory Economy, by the people, for the people, <laughs> you know, it's, um, and now this beautiful book that invites us to consider how to consolidate those ideas into actionable projects that we can pursue. What keeps you engaged? What keeps you motivated? Be, you know, I, I asked at the beginning, you know, how does a Harvard professor or someone who has privilege become so engaged, you know, in transforming a society that in some ways probably granted you some privilege and, and yet you're trying to undo that and create a more equitable society? I have six children and I have grandchildren and I am very concerned about them. It never dawned on me when I was growing up in the United States in the 50s and the 60s. I assumed that life was going to get better slowly. It was going to be frustrating. Progress would be made. But that every generation was going to have a somewhat better life than the one that had than the generation before. In some ways, that had been the history in the United States for 100 years. And when I was growing up, that was still seem to be what one could expect. But this last 40 years has been an incredible eye-opener. I always thought the problem was there will be progress. It'll just be painfully slow. And what I've now had to realize over the past 40 years is presuming progress, you can't presume progress. We have had 40 years in which we have gone backward, in which the standard of living for the average American has not gone forward at all. And now in many ways, it is far worse than it was. And so when I look at what my children and my grandchildren can expect, there's a kind of a desperation about it now, which is you can't just blissfully assume that your children and grandchildren will have a better life than you did. It's got to be fought for. It's not just going to unfold by itself. And there's some 
near disasters around the corner that have to be prevented for us to be in a situation where we can move things forward again. And I would argue that none of us can do it alone. We have to come together. No, absolutely not. And socialists have a tremendous amount to contribute, both in the short run and the long run. In the long run, I think we are the ones. (laughs) I, I do think that socialists and democratic socialists still are the ones who have most to contribute about how do we actually systematically change how we go about doing things so that our children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren can have better lives than we've had. So in that regard, I think the socialists still have a lot to contribute if we learn lessons. If we learn lessons and we actually get down to sort of discussions about concrete proposals with pros and cons that are discussed about how, how we suggest things be handled. But there's a tremendous amount of fighting that's going to that's gonna have to go on and be successful in order to, to land us in a position where we, can, where we can move on to those things. In the past, it's always been in Latin America where we had the chance to go on to those other things. Whereas here in the United States, we've never been in that situation. We have yet to be in a situation where we can go on to a systemically different kind of economy. Well, your book, Democratic Economic Planning, is a good primer for us to start thinking about how to create an economic system that serves the people. I I, I look forward to co-creating a world that has more justice for all people and where we can all breathe you know, the the air of creative processes that allow us to see each other and to let go of, you know, the, the shame and the guilt because that's going to be there. You know, we didn't invent empire, empire. We live in the belly of empire. And so it's our responsibility to do something about it, to transform it from within and to create examples, I feel, that will serve our children and the generations that will come after them. Well, Sylvia, I appreciate you and all you do in that regard. That's what all of us need to to basically just keep asking ourselves. Am I doing what I can? One of the things that I've learned over the past 40 years as a leftist is that we leftists spend a lot of time beating up on each other about, well, but you're not doing such and such, or I'm working on this and you're not working on that and that's what's wrong with you. There are plenty of tasks that need to be done, and people are going to need to do them for a long, long time. So my personal approach to this is go ahead and pick the ones that you're most comfortable with, do the things that you can sink the most energy into, um, and where you think you can make the biggest impact. Um, There's plenty of work out there of all sorts of different kinds, enough to choose from. Whether it's, it's doing a radio show or it's sort of working on economic theories of planning or whether it's demonstrating on a corner for Black Lives Matter, go ahead and embrace the cause that sort of resonates with you and the activities that you're most comfortable with. Um, and don't worry too much about whether or not, oh, well, you know, should I be doing something a little bit different? And certainly don't let somebody guilt you into thinking that, well, if you're not doing exactly what I'm doing, then somehow... There's something wrong with you. I think if we all take that approach, we'll just all be a lot more successful in building the kinds of movements we're going to need. Yeah. And I would say that we need to dance more. We need to gather more. We need to share stories and laugh more. You know, it doesn't have to be a serious movement. One of the things in Latin America is that in the midst of bombs dropping, we still had parties, <laughs> you know, we still had birthday parties and grandma's birthday was happening. You, we all went and had music, you know, it's life continues. As soon as you realize that it's a long haul, then I have to, I have to come up with a plan about my life that, you know, where I can sustain this for the long haul. And that includes joy. And, and, and that's exactly what you're saying. And, and I couldn't agree with you more that one of the ways we lose is that people come into the movement in some way, they throw themselves into it with a blind fury, um, and they burn out. Another thing we need to do is to keep people active for their whole lives. The oppression is what pushes people into activism, and we need to organize activism so it can be sustained over lifetimes. 
yeah. and that people don't burn out. Because otherwise, we don't end up with enough activists. <laughs> yes, I know. It's that simple. I agree. Sustaining our life force is as important as sustaining our social movements. So thank you for that. I appreciate you so much. And thank you for your beautiful book, Democratic Economic Planning. Um, how can people access your book? It's published by Rutledge. If you go to the Rutledge website, you can get it there. Um, I know a lot of people don't buy things off Amazon. I'm not going to tell you whether you should or you shouldn't, but it's, it's available on the Amazon site too. Now I'm going to warn people. This book has some heavy economic material in it. And, and the reason for that is that I do believe that socialists, people who are socialist activists and socialist politicians, are going to need economists to help them in organizing sort of economic institutions and processes. This book is, is addressed to economists saying, look, if you want to play a useful role in a desirable economy, this is the kind of stuff that you're going to have to grapple with and you're going to understand. Um, and I'm going to have to prove to you that this works. The book can be read by somebody who's not an economist without a lot of economics training. You just have to skip the parts that you obviously need to skip. You need to skip them or skim them. It's perfectly possible to read the book without being a, uh, without being a trained economist. But I just want to warn people that th th this book is primarily written for those of us who are economists who hopefully at some point will become useful um, as economists working in a desirable economy. It's, it's by Rutledge, and it came out, I think, on June 1st, for the first day it became available. And it's, you can get it off, you can get it through Amazon. If you, go, if you just go onto Amazon and go books and put my name in there, it'll, it'll pop up. Um, but you can also go to the Rutledge um, website. Oh, there's one other thing I should mention. I work now with some people all over the world on sort of various projects and ideas associated with participatory economics. And, I mean, these are people in Finland and Sweden and uh, England and Ireland, um, people in Spain, people in, in Uruguay. And there's a, there's a new website that this book is available on and all sorts of other materials and all sorts of other information, including a forum, a discussion forum. And that new website is www.com participatoryeconomy.org. And it's a real treasure trove of just materials, discussion forums, and things that, you know, that people might be interested that having to do with debates and discussions about what does a more desirable economy look like. So yes. that's www.participatoryeconomy.org. That's a website that uh, any of your listeners should just go ahead and, and visit Thank you again for being with us, and thank you for the richness of your activism, uh, your brilliant uh, intellectual engagement, and all your amazing contributions. Thank you again for being with us. Great being with you, Sylvia. Stay safe. Take care. Thank you for listening to Latin Waves. Latin Waves is an independently produced syndicated radio program made available for free to campus and community radios and also to the world at latinwavesmedia.com. Please visit the website to hear previous shows, hear about upcoming events, and consider becoming a member for as little as $1 per month.